Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the breast anatomy, and in particular female breast anatomy. And the reason I think this is very important for us to, to consider and, and, and to discuss is that it's important to know the anatomy and the structures of the breast because what we really want to get at is an understanding of how uh, milk is let down from the breast after a baby is born. And so we want to talk ultimately talk about the, the, the letdown reflex and the and the functionality of the breasts. And then and also kick around some of the hormones responsible and uh, the content of milk. But it all begins with the understanding of the anatomy of the breasts. And so let's get right into that discussion. And so again, you know, we're familiar uh, with the outside uh, of the breasts. In other words, uh, you know, you can look at this and say, well, these darkened structures right here surrounding the nipple are called the areola. And so we, we like to think that the areola is um, sort of a darkened, pigmented part of the skin of the breast. And the, and the, and the uh, idea there is that the baby, uh, a newborn baby, isn't very good at seeing. And so it kind of provides a, uh, a target for the baby to find the nipple. And the nipple is where the milk is going to be released to the outside. And during pregnancy, the areola becomes a little bit more darker than it normally is. Now, the breast itself sits on top of its major muscle, a chest muscle, called pectorialis. And so the pectorialis muscle major is, uh, is um, below the breast tissue. And so all of this tissue right here. And so this is what we want to talk about. We want to talk about how the fact that, you know, to begin this discussion is that the breast develops um, and enlarges during female puberty. And so that's really under the control of the, the hormone estrogen in particular. And so it increases in size. But when you look at it underneath, in other words, below the skin, you know, sub, subdermal, you'll notice that there's a lot of adipose tissue forming what is the main structure of the breast. And then you have a variety of mammary glands uh, that are supported within that uh, cushiony adipose tissue. There's also, uh, so here's your pectorialis muscle right back here. And there's also a lot of connective tissue that supports these mammary glands. And so this connective tissue is composed, uh, again, as, as you may know, connective tissue, there's a lot of collagen and elastin protein that are in between these mammary glands that I'm pointing at right here. And then all of that kind of culminates into another type of fibrous connective tissue called a ligament. And so that suppensatory ligament or supporting the, the breast itself, these ligaments are pretty important. They're called Cooper's ligaments and help to keep the breast upright. And so again, the adipose tissue is support. And then inside uh, you have these lobes which are, which are made up of the uh, mammary glands. And then on the outside, again, is the areola, which is this dark pigmented area. And then the nipple. What's curious about the nipple is that sometimes you might look at this and go, you know, I don't, I don't see any opening at all. But the truth is there is no single opening. There's actually many openings in the nipple itself, and they're, and they're microscopic. And all of those openings are because each mammary gland is connected to a duct, and that duct is called a lactiferous duct. And so these ducts lead the milk from the mammary gland down into the nipple. And so there's many of these ducts uh, that are culminating into the nipple. And then these little swellings or little reservoirs right here where the milk is, is temporarily stored are called uh, lactiferous sinuses. Okay, And so these, these uh, uh, sacs, if you will, made up of, of milk glands or sometimes uh, called alveoli. We saw that term being used before in a previous video we were talking about the alveoli of the lungs. Okay, And so, you know, here's, here's my attempt at, at drawing this. And so, uh, sorry about if it's not so good, but here's the outer part of the breast, here's the areola, and here's, here's the lactiferous ducts. And I'll go ahead and label that. So lactiferous right there, lactiferous ducts, right there. 
And then these blue structures right here are what we're going to call the, the mammary glands, of course. Mammary glands. And then, so the milk is being produced in the mammary glands, and it's traveling down the lactiferous ducts and then ultimately out the nipple. This bark, darkened pigment is the areola. And so what I wanted to emphasize is this sort of red tissue right here. This, the glands themselves are surrounded by a type of tissue called myoepithelial. Make sure I got that spelled right. Myoepithelial cells. And the reason I'm emphasizing myoepithelial cells is these, these muscle cells, they're sort of uh, modified epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are cells that surround and so these are these modified epithelial cells that can contract are going to be really key in releasing the milk to the outside. And so that so I want to emphasize that. And so the, here are the mammary glands. And so I mentioned earlier that there was a lot of um, let me go white on this. Uh, there was a lot of connective tissue. And so there's a lot of connective tissue right in here. And this is the collagen and elastin right in here that surround and support these mammary glands. So these are the these this is a connective tissue, collagen and elastin. And then ultimately what we have is these all, all connect to these ligaments. And I mentioned before there those are called Cooper no, person's name. Cooper's ligaments. Ligaments. And those are important. And so uh, then we have uh, you know, ultimately, the, the bulk of what the breast is is adipose tissue. And so we have lots of this specialized, again, connective tissue called adipose tissue, which is a storage of triglycerides, but it's also very supportive. And so what's curious is sometimes, you know, women will ask this question, you know, if, they, if their breasts are, they, or they feel that their breasts are not as large as maybe someone else's, they're... You know, like flat chested or something like that, would they still be able to breastfeed? And of course they would, because a lot of the a lot of the size and shape of the breasts is dominated by this by this adipose tissue, and it's really the the mammary glands or the alveolar glands that that are producing the milk. And so there's no problem with that. And so um, here's an actual uh, microscopic hist histological look at those myoepithelial cells that are capable of contracting, and it's these epithelial cells right in here, which are glandular, which are going to be the ones uh, producing the milk. And because the milk travels in the lactiferous duct to the outside of the body, it's considered to be an exocrine gland. And so the mammary gland is an exocrine gland. And so here you can see um, the adipose tissue, and here's a, here's a look at the Cooper's ligament right there. So these are the these are the suppensatory uh, ligaments that are holding the breast up, and so uh, maybe a more simplified drawing of the of the mammary glands here in the lactiferous ducts, or you could just call them mammary glands. You can call them you know here's milk ducts. It's sort it's sort of fine. And then the nipple has these multiple openings right in here, and here's the areola. And so what's interesting is the the breast. I think we know this is found in both uh, sexes, but um, the real role of it is that it, you know, the, these these glands are dormant in men, but they they become active in women, um, and they become a, capable of producing milk after the baby is born. And so uh, that's its main function is to produce milk and to nourish a newborn baby. And so developmentally, I find this kind of interesting. This is uh, again a look at the glands. This is what the the breast would look like in a. Uh, after a mammography, and so that's an X-ray examination to look at the at the breast. It's usually used for screening to make sure that there's no uh, breast cancer. And and uh, I actually want to kick that idea around a little bit, breast cancer. But I find it kind of interesting that these glands are uh, developmentally uh, they they're really modified sweat glands. And so a sweat gland. I think you're, again, familiar with the fact that that's also exocrine. That's producing sweat that travels to the outside of the body. So these are modified sweat glands, but in, pr instead of producing sweat, they're producing milk, which is nourishing the baby. And so each of these, these lobes or mammary glands have these smaller chambers or lobules 
which uh, contain these alveolar glands, which actually produce the milk when the woman is lactating, and that, that means producing milk. So if a woman has given birth, this is the adipose tissue, the mammary gland will be lactating or generating milk. And so let's actually talk about this cancer a little bit because it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a sober uh, conversation because the, the statistics are, are rather, uh, rather high in terms of developing uh, cancer, but I want to spin it on a positive level. So when I say that one in every eight women will develop uh, breast cancer in their life, that should draw our attention to it and make us a little bit more aware and maybe be preventative and um, alert to the possibility as opposed to depressed and uh, not thinking that we can do anything about it. And so outside of what I would normally recommend, I'm not a physician, but I would normally recommend a healthy diet and exercise. And one of the things that you cannot control is basically your genes. And so uh, unfortunately, 10% of, of breast cancer uh, is inheritable. And so as it turns out, that uh, there's been many studies to try to locate the genes that are responsible for these breast cancers. And just wanted to highlight these, these two genes, BRCA1 and 2. These are, without getting into a lot of detail, these are sort of uh, oncogene, which are cancer gene uh, suppressing um, locations. And so what, what you could do if you're concerned about heredity being a component in your family, in other words, a, a mother, or, or an aunt or a cousin has breast cancer, you could uh, sample your DNA. Um, in other words, go to a hospital or, or send in your, your uh, saliva to one of those genetic test centers. And so what you'll do is just basically uh, your saliva contains uh, some of your, your cheek cells. And basically all that company is going to be doing is cracking those cheek cells open, extracting the DNA, uh, amplifying it, and targeting by putting your your uh, your DNA on little microchips and looking for whether or not you have a uh, mutated allele in, the, in these particular genes doesn't necessarily mean that you'll uh, have breast cancer, but it's certainly uh, a sign that you might. And so it's something to look into. So 80% of women who are carry this altered altered gene will develop breast cancer. So it's something that you might want to know if there's a family member with, with breast cancer, and so uh, located on chromosome 17 and 13. So one of the things I also want to point out outside of taking a genetic test is that there's some signs, uh, obviously a lump would, would suggest that there's a tumor, uh, in other words, cells uh, growing out of control like a lump uh, in the breast, and also some leakage from the nipple and some skin discoloration are, are some signs of breast cancer. But again, you'll want to go in uh, to your doctor, physician, and they'll be able to inform you on, on what to look for and, and be attentive to it. Okay, And what I will say about it is that um, if you were to uh, check the breast, in other words, do a self-examination, there's, there's a couple of pretty cool videos on breast examination that you can consider on YouTube. Basically, you should. I, I would recommend doing this uh, periodically, like maybe once a month, and get into a pattern of, of checking the breast, looking for little lumps, uh, maybe once a month. That's what I would say. But the thing is, um, sometimes the tumor, the thing is you want to detect it really early. And so sometimes when, if, if a tumor is very, very small, like the, the size of a grain of sand or something, it, it, it's difficult to detect by hand. And so... Uh, you would go in, and this is a picture of a, a, of a woman receiving a mammogram. And so it's an x-ray of the breast. And so you can really detect small um, tumors before they become uh, out of control. And then maybe those could be cut out or excised from the breast. And there's also sort of levels of, of um, what you could do with that. You could re remove the lump or you can remove par partial of the breast and then maybe remove the entire breast if it's if it's uh, if it's further along and so basically what I wanted to say is that you should perform these monthly checkups um, 
as they're basically called self-examination, and it, this should be a priority to be proactive. And again, the American Cancer Society is going to recommend that you go in for a mammogram uh, because it's hard to detect these really small ones that are less than a centimeter, as I was mentioning. Uh, starting at age 40, uh, depending on your physician, depending on your family history, this could be a little sooner. Uh, but basically in this, in this uh, the 40s uh, decade, uh, you're coming in every two years for a mammogram, and then it's recommended at age 50 or so, maybe every year, to make sure that you're doing okay. And I just wanted to finish with, you know, things progress in medicine um, optimistically. And so we, every, every, uh, every year we, we have new discoveries. And so there's blood tests that can um, pretty accurately pre predict whether or not when a person's had breast cancer, whether or not it's going to reoccur again. Uh, and we're trying to develop uh, blood tests to even detect uh, cancer early on in the breast in women. And so I hope this was helpful. I hope I was informative in learning a little bit about breast anatomy and a little bit about breast cancer. But I really hope that it's, it's really just an invitation for you to explore and read more about uh, the breast and breast cancer. There's, there's so many uh, sites on the Internet that will discuss breast cancer because, again, it's such a big deal. And um, maybe someday you'll want to participate in fundraising uh, to uh, raise money to prevent uh, breast cancer and to treat breast cancer in women who have it. So hopefully that's inspiration. So thank you for watching.